Initially, hello everyone and welcome to our webinar, how to get accepted to a top ranked MBA program. Uh, my name is Nelly and I'll be the moderator on behalf of UNIMI prep team. I'm here with Shimi Winters, who is head of Oringo admission consulting firm. And we're going to talk about a CVs, essays and letters of recommendation you will need to prepare in order to apply and get accepted in your dream school. Before starting, I just want to let you know that you can ask questions anytime during the webinar using the Q&A box and we'll answer later. All questions are welcome, so don't hesitate. Um, now we are all set, so I'm giving the floor to our speaker, Shimri. Okay, hi everyone. I'm really excited to be here. Can you hear me, Nelly, is this okay? Okay. Good, we had lots of technical issues, but now we're working, so it's, everything's working. Okay, so today this uh, uh, session is actually gonna be a double session. And I'm gonna talk about two topics. So it's gonna be a session for beginners a bit. And in this session, I will explain a bit about why do an MBA, what is a top MBA, etc. So if you just wanted some general information, this is the right place. And in the second part of this session, we'll talk about a bit more progressive stuff and advanced stuff about how to write you know, the best CV, the best essays, the best recommendations for top MBA programs. Um, feel free to write to me um, some questions, comments in the chat. I will be looking at them throughout the uh, presentation. And I'll also ask you a few questions throughout the presentation. So we're just gonna use the chat here for this session. So let's start. Very long presentation, so let's start just a bit about me. My name is Shimri Winters. I'm a London Business School graduate. Uh, at the end of my London Business School MBA, I used to interview for the school. Uh, I interviewed tens of applicants to the school. Uh, I've been at the Ringo MBA admissions for the last eight years full time. This is what I do. Um, that's it for me. A bit about the Ringo. It's my only marketing slide. Um, <laughs> so we help candidates get into top MBA programs. Quite simple. Uh, how do we do this? We, um, first of all, we do give them a little chances estimation. We help them decide which schools to apply to. And, you know, we do kind of a project plan. Um, and then we actually help with the application itself. Check us out on oringo.com. We're really good. Ah, we even have a graph. And the blue is how great we are. And the red is general admission statistics. Okay, that was my marketing. Wow, I'm very good at marketing. Now let's move to this presentation. So again, the agenda here is the first 15 minutes. I'm going to talk very quickly because maybe some of you know this kind of stuff. I'm just going to talk about, you know, general stuff regarding top MBA programs. What is an MBA? What are the top MBA programs? How much money does it cost? How much money will you get at the end? How to choose uh, England versus France versus Canada uh, versus US um, and that kind of stuff. So I'm gonna run very quickly and talk very quickly and not look at your questions because it's just gonna be general information. The second part of this presentation will be more specific about the application process for top MBA programs. I'll discuss what is an application, what does that um, have inside of it, but I'll also discuss um, how to write a very good resume, how to write a very good, uh, you know, very good essays, what do you do about the recommendations, etc. cetera. Uh, there's some other stuff in this uh, presentation as well, uh, but let's just go through the initial slides very quickly. So what is an MBA? A lot of times I get candidates who call me and say, well, I'm debating between an MBA, master's in business administration and a different master, okay? It can be a master in law, LLM or master in public administration, it's called MPA or MPP, public policy, or masters in whatever, okay, finance, geography, <laughs> computer science, etc. The way I like to look at it is a master's in something is first of all in a specific industry, right? A master's in geography or master's in law. And you usually do a specification within that master's. So you usually do corporate law or usually do a master's in finance with a derivatives in a, I don't know, high interest rate environment specialization. So when we say, when we talk about master degrees, we usually discuss very specific master degrees with very specific specializations. Now, if you know what you want to do when you grow up, if you know you want to be in a very specific area, maybe a master's is for you. 
An MBA is actually a very general business degree. You learn microeconomics, strategy, entrepreneurship, accounting, and that's just in the core courses. And then you have lots of um, electives where you can actually take it in whichever way you want. It's usually better for career transitions, for people who want to change their career. And the method is very different. The method of learning is usually based on case-based discussions. So you don't just open a book and you, you know, read page 100. You discuss the way that EasyJet and Ryanair price their tickets, for example. Um, an MBA is also a degree that requires prior professional work experience. And we'll discuss exactly how much and when is it too much. But uh, it, that, that is a prerequisite for an MBA, which many masters don't require prior work experience. So that's just a bit about, do I do a master's in something or do I go for like a more general business master's, which is usually the MBA. The MBA motivation is usually the career switchers or people who want to, so you know, you're a lawyer, but you want to be in venture capital or you're something else and you want to be a consultant. A master's is good for an accelerator, but that's also an MBA is good. Okay, for someone who wants to stay in the current industry, who wants to be in a higher level, et cetera. And a future entrepreneur, again, you can decide, do you do a master's, an MBA, which would probably be good, or maybe, I uh, don't know, just go and develop your idea if you want. I put here like me time, I think the MBA and generally a master's, uh, if you're working today and you have a, maybe a good job, a good salary, again, is, is not an easy thing to do to leave everything and go and study a full-time degree one or two years. And I think uh, that's, I, I've seen a lot of people just say, I, I can definitely continue in my route, but I want to take some time for me and go and do an MBA for a year or two years. We'll discuss that and kind of decide afterwards what I want to be when I, when I grow up. <laughs> okay. Um, so I've put here three types of MBAs again. So now we're going specific into what is an MBA. And when I say the word MBA, I mean full-time MBA. Okay, so I mean a full-time MBA. We'll discuss this, but in the US, it's usually two years. Uh, in Europe, it's usually a year to a year and a half. Uh, full-time degree, the average age is 28. Years of experience around four to six to seven. This means if you have one year or if you have 15 years, this is starting to be a problem for the full-time MBAs. They don't like someone which is beyond We'll discuss this why, but which is beyond maybe 12 years of full-time experience. So if you have more than 12, again, I'll show this, or less than two, maybe you're looking for a different kind of MBA degree. Um, there's also executive MBAs. In my jargon, executive MBAs means a part-time MBA. This means you continue living in the country you live in today because the executive MBA will not give you a visa to a different country. So if you live in China, it will be very difficult to do an executive MBA in Colombia because you can't be every Thursday evening in New York. So it's very difficult. So it's a part-time MBA. It means you go into campus on weekends or maybe block weeks out of you know, a few days in every month for every two weekends or three or four. It depends on the program. But um, um, it's very good for professionals who want to stay in their current job and just study an MBA in parallel to their career. Um, and there's also something called senior full-time executive MBAs. There are very few programs like this. Um, you have my email in the chat and I'll show you at the end. Uh, this discussion won't be about that, but there are a few options at MIT, at Stanford, at London Business School. Um, talk to me separately if this is relevant for you and if you have more than 12 years of experience and you want to go for a full-time senior program. Uh, again, I'm accepting questions on the chat, yes, but I'm just doing this very, very quickly, this, start, this section, so we get into the actual application process. Uh, there's other types of programs, but I think these three kind of define the main types. So there's something called a part-time MBA, but it's very similar to the executive MBA. Basically, it's a part-time MBA. There's something called an online MBA. I think you all understand what that means. Um, there's a hybrid MBA, which is probably online with one or two face-to-face -face, uh, on-campus meetings, et cetera. So it's kind of a hybrid, but basically it's an online. Um, there's some global executive MBAs, which means maybe one or two schools are combining their program. So there's a London Business School, Columbia University, and Hong Kong University joint executive MBA. Okay, every month you go to a different campus. Amazing, but it still falls in this definition of the executive MBA. So today we're going to mainly talk about the full-time MBA, 
Although the tips I'll give you about the essays and the res resume and the recommendations are very similar to the other programs as well. So what, you know, what are the best programs? Okay, you know, a lot of times people tell me, what's the best program in the world? Well, the answer is there isn't one. And the reason is that, you know, I've put here six uh, logos of MBA rankings. And guess what? They don't have the same program in number one. They don't even have the same top 10 programs. They don't even have the same top 30 programs. So recently I saw the, I think it was last week, the Financial Times MBA ranking for 2022. This is the first question for the chat. Who do you think was number one there? So first question to the chat. I want the school you think was ranked number one in the Financial Times MBA ranking, 2022. Okay, we have one answer. I'll give you another second. Okay, so I'll talk meanwhile, but you start because I'm not going to give the answer yet. Um, usually people tell me Harvard and Stanford. Uh, actually, in, I think in three or four uh, of the last uh, years at the Financial Times MBA ranking, NCAD was ranked number one. This year, Wharton, University of Pennsylvania, Wharton was number one. I think NCAD was three together with Harvard. So, you know, what does this mean? Nothing. <laughs> okay. So there's lots of top brands, especially in the US. I think most of us, and, you know, I like to say my mother knows these brands. Okay. So she's seen a Hollywood film where the star or the daughter or the son of the star goes to Harvard, goes to MIT, goes to Columbia, goes to UCLA. Okay, so the big universities in the US are big in everything. And they're usually very good at sort of the MBA programs. And I'll show you later the salaries. It's less important if you go to a number two school or a number six school. You know, they're all great. So I think Harvard is great and it's only ranked three. And I think Wharton's great where it's ranked one. And I think MIT is great, by the way, on the Financial Times MBA ranking, MIT was ranked 11. I think you'll all agree it's one of the top schools in the world. So these are the top schools in the US. If I look at the schools at Europe, they're very different. Most of these schools, maybe Oxford and Cambridge are a bit different, only have MBAs or, or business management from some kind. This means they don't offer um, geography and they don't offer undergraduate degrees. And this means that um, when uh, I asked my mother, she doesn't know what HEC Paris is, or she doesn't know, well, London Business School, she was at my graduation, so, you know, she knows that. So um, a lot of people, when I talk to them about top brands, and I say, uh, you know, NCAD, they say, what's that? I've never heard of that. I want a top brand like Cornell. Now, Cornell is great, but NCAD was ranked higher in every single ranking. So don't, don't think about the stigmas. Do a bit of it, you know, investigate a bit and you'll see that the European schools are great and I'll show you soon salaries, I'll show you employers, you know, they're all good. How do you decide between the schools? Well, you know, there's different methods to decide. Um, you know, the, the proper way really is to think about your career aspirations and where would you like to go and then to look at the school culture and things like that. I think I like to look at the second part. I think the main difference between the top programs is the location and again, the, the studies are very similar. The professors are very similar. The courses are similar. Same textbooks, same cases. The main difference between London Business School and Columbia is one's in London and one's in New York. The second thing I'm, I would look at is ranking. Now, I said before, there isn't a big difference between three and 11, but definitely a school which is ranked uh, 100 in the world is uh, your career opportunities will be less good than a school that's ranked in the top 20. And the third thing that I look at, and again, I would love to ignore this, but a lot of people you know, talk to me about it, is the cost of the program. If you get into two programs and one offers you a scholarship and one doesn't, or one is one year and the return on investment is much quicker because you're gonna, you're gonna work after a year and one is two years. So that is a consideration as well. Again, each of you need to decide what your uh, criteria are. Um, you know, I spoke to a candidate about Chicago and then his wife came on the line and said, I'm not living in Chicago. It's very cold in the winter. <laughs> and, and that's fine. That's her criteria, right? That there's nothing wrong with what she said. 
And I spoke to someone else who said, no way, uh, you know, I don't want to live in England. I don't like uh, the cold weather or gray or whatever. <laughs> so, you know, everybody needs to decide on their criteria. But again, I think the location is definitely a huge criteria. Um, when we look at money, <laughs> MBAs are very, very expensive. We're talking around $70,000 per year tuition rate in the US times that by two because the MBAs are two years add a very cheap accommodation and McDonald's food every day, easily, easily, you're above $200,000 in cost, easily. Okay, probably 230, 240 for one, and that's if you go by yourself. In Europe, uh, the cost is very high, but the MBAs are shorter. They're usually one year or one and a half years. Uh, the cost per year is very similar, but like we said, you start working quicker. Uh, and just reminding you, if you have questions, you can write them in the chat. If not, I'll try and answer everything and answer the end things. Um, how do you uh, fund an MBA? Well, of course, if you have money, that's the best. Um, but there's a lot of scholarships. And last year, we just did all our statistics. 56% of our candidates got a scholarship. Okay, And scholarship can be a full ride, a full scholarship. And it can be less than a full ride. It can be, I'm trying to think what the lowest scholarship was. I think it was around $20,000. So it can be, you know, nice to have, but still I need more money. And you can get MBA loans. Um, sometimes it's financial need based. And there's some, very few external scholarships. Um, that's a whole new session about how to fund your MBA. Uh, the good thing is the salaries are very high. These are salaries from three years ago. Again, I need to update this slide because salaries are higher today. And we're talking about a base salary, um, starting salary in the first year before bonuses. There are bonuses before options in the company. There are options and shares. Um, so before sign up bonus, et cetera. So these are the base salaries. Um, as you can see, they're very, very similar. The main reason why there's a drop from uh, Stanford to uh, MIT or Kellogg isn't because MIT or Kellogg's recruiters are paying less. It's mainly because a lot of the Stanford uh, alumni will work in California. And a lot of the MIT or Kellogg alumni might work in Boston or Chicago, where the cost of living is less. So they might both go to McKinsey, but they might just make a bit less every month. But that's OK, because their rent will be less and their cost of living will be less. So what I'm trying to show you here is forget the stigmas. The salaries are very, very similar. Same in Europe, salaries are very high, okay? Nothing to worry about. And here I just took a slide from London Business School to show you the recruiters that came to London Business School. And I think you will see a very similar slide if you look at Columbia recruiters or Wharton recruiters or UCLA recruiters. Now it won't be identical. And I'm sure British Telecom don't recruit from UCLA on a recurring basis, but you, know, you will see the same McKinsey or Google um, or some of, you know, just general global giants, um, I don't know, Airbnb or, uh, or even Burger King who rec or PepsiCo who recruit for their management rotation programs and they're just looking for excellent managers. So very similar kind of recruiters, both in Europe and in the US, obviously in the top MBA programs, as I said, I don't know where to put the line, but it, it's not after two or 10 or 20 programs, but there's definitely a difference if you look at the, I don't know, program that's ranked 100. Okay, if someone re joined just now, I'm just reminding you, these are very general statistics slides. We nearly finished with them, and then we're going to dig in to how to get into a top MBA program, and I have some slides for you there. Uh, I just wanted to kind of uh, show some alarms, <laughs> okay? So I tried to mention this at the beginning. If you have more than 12 years of experience, top MBA programs, you know, have a problem with that. If you're a bit older, like 35, 37, 40, top MBA programs might have an issue with that. If you're too successful, I know that sounds like an advantage. If you're the CEO of Google, that might be uh, quite a lot. Uh, if uh, that might be a problem for the schools. If you're unemployable, maybe you weren't employed for the last two years because you couldn't find a job. <laughs> That's an alarm for the MBA program. So there's a lot of alarms regarding your profile. And schools, I have to admit, they like their candidates to be from a certain type. Again, they like diversity, but they like them to be a certain age. Yes, 25 to 30-ish. 
with X amount of years of experience, yes, three to seven, let's say, with X amount, of, you know, high GMATs, average is 730 in the top school. So, you know, if you have 40 or 50 points below that, et cetera. Again, talk to me for very specific uh, questions, et cetera. Um, I love the this question in the chat. So if I'm saying the rankings aren't like, uh, you know, if you can't believe them, how do I know what a top program is? So first of all, I, I didn't say um, a ranking, you can't believe it. All I said, there's many rankings. So in the top 10 MBA programs, there's like 30 schools. <laughs> okay, uh, because there's many rankings. Now, if you look at the rankings, you will see the salaries of the alumni. You will see how long it took nine, uh, sorry, how many alumni found the job within a month or within three months. You will see, uh, I don't know, the percent of female students. You will, see, you will see all the statistics, but you will see very similar statistics in the top 10 schools. Okay, so that's it. We finish all our general stuff. And now we're going to talk about the MBA applications. And the first thing I just wanted to discuss is like the plus. So when do you apply? What is an application? And that kind of stuff. And then we'll dig into the application itself. So. I love speaking so much. Start asking me questions. Ah, this is an interactive session. Soon you're going to have some questions you're going to have to answer on the chat. Be prepared. There's a prize for the fastest answerer. I, no prize, but a lot of honor. Um, okay, so what is an MBA program and how do you apply? Again, we discussed like the prerequisites that you have to have the professional experience. So let's say I'm 28. I'm, uh, I have five years of experience from Deloitte. Amazing. I want to apply. What do I need to apply? So First of all, I need an undergraduate degree. Okay, I think that makes sense. An MBA is a master's degree. A second degree, you need to start with your first degree. Okay, if you have that, most MBA programs, most, most, all top ones will require an exam that's called GMAT. If you want to do an alternative exam that's called GRE, fine as well, but you will need one of these exams. There is a third exam. It came up about 10 years ago. It's mainly for executive MBAs, although very few full-time regular MBAs accept it as well. It's called Executive Assessment, EA. Again, you can ask me privately if you want which exam you need to do. Uh, right now, I think nearly 80% uh, in top 10 US schools take the GMAT and 20% take the GRE. In the international schools, the GMAT percentage is even higher. Schools are indifferent to both these tests, so you can take any of them, uh, that's fine. And if you don't come from an uh, English speaking country or your undergraduate degree was not in English, you might need to take an English proficiency test like IELTS or TOEFL or PTE. So just check out that you have these prerequisites, okay? A GMAT can take a couple of months to study for. So if you want to, soon I'll show you the deadlines, but if you want to apply tomorrow for an MBA, you're, you're in trouble because the GMAT might take a couple of months. Let's say you have these prerequisites, then you have the application. And you know, this is when I, where I come in and when I see my candidates. And this can take a couple of months as well because NCAD have seven essays. HSA Paris, five essays. These are very long applications. Stanford, five essays. These are very long applications. Add to that your resume. You need two recommenders to write for you recommendations, which can take them a long time. There's a few online um, application stuff. The application is long, okay? And after all that, you might even have the interview. So what does the application process look like? This is the NCAD process, but it's very, very similar in all schools. Uh, basically, you apply with all the stuff we discussed before, right? Your resume, your essays, your letters of recommendation, you submit your GMAT score, your IELTS score, whatever. Once you apply, you need to wait. And NCI does have a video interview uh, section. Again, let's say that's part of the submission of the initial section. Once you apply, you have to wait. And there's some kind of screening process. And only the lucky ones or the more successful applicants will get an interview. Once they do the interview, then they need to wait for the final decision. All this process can take up to three months. So if you're applying September, you might only hear your final, final answer. I know NCI had say 10 weeks for the slower school, only three months later, okay? The quickest schools I know take three weeks, okay? So it's still, it takes a couple of weeks between the application and the actual submission. When are the deadlines? So if we look at September 23, but please add the year if this is less relevant for you. 
the first deadline will be in September 22, so one year before the start date. And the second deadline will be in January. Now, if you saw, I didn't mention any schools here because this is correct for 90% of the schools. So most of the schools, again, not all of them, most of the schools will start in September and you can apply a year before and onwards, let's say in January. Some schools also have a January intake like NCAD or Columbia. And obviously their dates will be a bit different, but these are in addition to their September intakes. Some schools like IMD or Bocconi will only start in January, but again, these are very specific schools. Um, European schools have more rounds, uh, but basically the earlier, the better. And if you see, I didn't even mention this round three in April, because to get into an US school as an international applicant in round three is very difficult. You really want to apply in round one and round two. Uh, so someone asked on the chat, are there more scholarships in round one? Um, so if we look at the US, again, there's only advantages for round one, okay? There's only advantages. And round one is great. Round two is fine as well. Most schools, the chance of getting into round two is very similar to round one. The scholarship chances are a bit less, but still kind of similar. And the, the rule of thumb, the, you know, my tip to you is this. If you're ready, apply early. But it's always better to wait till round two if you need the extra time for your application. Let me give you a very simple quantitative example. If you can score 20 more points on the GMAT in round two, apply in round two. Okay, regardless of which school and what's your application, what the GMAT is. So I'm just saying 20 more points, it's worth your while to wait till round two. Nevertheless, there's many advantages in round one. Your chances are a bit higher. There's a bit more scholarships. And from a project management perspective, it's better because let's say I, you know, I have my school wish list and I have five schools on my wish list. And let's say Harvard is the top. So I can apply to in round one just to Harvard. And let's say I don't get in, bummer. But then in round two, I can apply to MIT, my backup school. But if I apply in round two to my Harvard, then round three, the chances are less dramatic, the less in a dramatic way, okay? And then I'm, I'm really hurting my chances. So from a project management perspective, definitely apply in round one and also from a chances perspective. Okay, I love that question, thank you. Right, are you ready? So let's, now that we know we need a resume, we know we need essays and we know we need recommendations, let's talk about that a bit. Let's talk about what goes into these element and how do you create a great application? So I think the first uh, part of a great application is the resume. Again, I used to interview for London Business School. I used to receive the entire application of candidates. It used to come in a PDF. I think it was around 40 pages. Everything, okay, your online application and your essays and your resume and your uh, recommendations and whatever you wrote and you know, everything, 40 pages of PDF. The first page like had your name and your GMAT, okay? So like and your nationality and gender, okay? So just a bit of, you know, stats about you. The second page was the resume. Okay, so this is the most important element of your application. It's just one page, okay? If you have a two page resume, it's just one page. If you want to write a long resume, just one page, okay? Full-time MBAs only accept one page resumes. It's very different than your work resume, okay? and let me just tell you about myself. My undergraduate degree was in computer science. And before my MBA, I used to be a programmer. So my resume, I, I don't remember, but I'm assuming said, knows Java very well. <laughs> Programs in five program languages and knows uh, to use SQL database commands. Okay, that makes sense for a programmer, right? But my MBA resume said, led a team of two people worked with Vodafone, Ireland, Spain, and UK. Okay, so it's very different. It talks about my accomplishments and talks about my environment of working and less about what I do. Do I do Java or C++? Because that's less interesting for an MBA. So it's a very different type of MBA. Um, so I mentioned here a few tips. Again, this is going to be, uh, after this live session, we're going to upload it on YouTube and you can also you know, go through it slower. Very important to have a company description. Even if you work for Amazon or Deloitte or Coca-Cola, just explain which department you're in. Uh, don't take it for granted that the 
admissions know your company, know what they do, know that it's the biggest pharma company in Germany. They don't necessarily know that. Obviously, show your responsibilities. You remember I showed I was, uh, I led two people. That's quite impressive for a 26-year-old, okay? Um, was chosen as the best employee of the year, month. Okay, so that's a nice honor. Um, and also one very important thing is when you finish your resume, you're going to move to the essays. Then just go back to your resume and just make sure that there's a connection, and I'll speak about this later, between your resume and your essays. Let me give you an example. Let's say my resume says this. I was a waiter. And then I got promoted to be a shift manager. Then I was promoted to be the restaurant uh, something, I don't know, daytime manager. Let's say that's a high. And all that in four years. So that's great, right? Three, three promotions in four years. Uh, that's good. Don't worry about the restaurant part. And then I write my career goals is to be finance manager at Amazon. Okay, well, there's no connection to what I did. But if I can say, you know, I was the, in charge of the finances of the restaurant, I was in charge of the PL, I worked with accounting firms on the yearly reports. Then I connected my job, which I probably did. I'm sure a restaurant manager is in charge of the PL, the profit and loss of the restaurant. So then I connected better to my essays, et cetera. And I just gave here an example, right? So I think if you're looking for a legal job and you want to do real estate, it's very good to say you're a lawyer that deals with real estate, but an MBA resume is very different. And, you know, I had, uh, you know, I, of, you know, I work and the head of the biggest law firm, real estate departments, it's not just, you know, a real estate. I work in the best law firm, the biggest real estate department. I head it. I lead the team of four. Look how much, how many achievements I wrote in just two lines. Okay. So that's kind of a, uh, uh, how you write a resume for MBAs. Someone's asking me about the biggest mistake I've seen on resumes. Um, I uh, don't want to ruin the surprise, which is in two pages. Um, but actually, I, I will tell you, I get a lot of resumes, you know, because people send me their resume. They just send it me for a profile review. And again, you have my email in the chat. You can always send me your resume for a little profile review. Um, and uh, it's okay because people don't send me an MBA resume, okay? They send me like, a, the, you know, what they're sending to work. And it's just completely wrong. The, 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 you know, I get an eight page resume and it's just, it's very hard to understand what they actually do. And an MBA resume, it's very, you know, I don't understand what you do, but I want to see your achievements. I want to see the employer you work for. I want to see your um, position title. And now I want to see some achievements very high up the resume. I don't want to hold, you know, history. By the way, MBA resumes don't have a paragraph at the beginning. I love to ride horses and I, I'm looking for my next. They don't have all that. Achievement, achievement, achievement. Um, again, because I work very closely with people, I don't really see mistakes. I, you know, we correct them very quickly. So uh, hard, but soon I'll actually show you something. Again, wait two slides. Um, so that was the professional part of the resume. There's actually at least two more areas of the resume. Remember, I don't want any, uh, something at the beginning, uh, you know, general about myself. I'm 28 and I love, forget all that. You can either start with your professional experience or your academics and then have the other one. And the second part is your academics. Again, maybe this is not a mistake, but this is something to say. Don't just say studied at, uh, I don't know, Munich University and uh, computer science. No, that's not enough. Mention something specific. And my thesis was about, or I got a merit, cum laude, whatever, Dean's List. Or, you know, if I didn't get a merit, I was part of the student association or I did something special. Okay, the business schools want to see that you're very active in university. You also got good grades, but you also were active. And all you can do is play your strengths. If you did something special, you know, play on that. And extracurriculars are very, very important. So usually when I used to interview candidates, I used to look for three areas. Yes, are you academic? And I can show this with your GPA and your GMAT and what you studied. What's your professional experience? Yes, have you progressed in that restaurant? And, you know, did you, is this impressive? But also, who are you? Okay, would I want you in the class? Or are you a dry biscuit? <laughs> Okay, someone that I, you know, great, you have great grades and you're so professional, but you're like the most boring person in the world. Now, extracurriculars can be volunteering, but they can also be something else. They can be, you have nice hobbies, 
you run a you ran a marathon, you play volley beach volleyball, you like detective movies. <laughs> okay, this is nice. And it's, you know, it's funny, it's nice. And it's, it just means that you're a human being. You're fun, interesting. Very, very important. Okay, and um, here's an example of our CV and a resume. And this is actually gonna be quite a good one because I wrote it, sorry. <laughs> so I started here with my education, okay? And I, you know, I wrote very clearly, okay? Where I studied, okay? So in Penn State University. And I wrote exactly what I studied very clearly. I know it looks boring. There's no graphics, there's no pictures. This is what MBA programs want to see, okay? And then in my first bullet, I just said, you know, I have an amazing GPA in the US, uh, the, the, the top GPA is 4.0. So I got 395, it's amazing. I was on the Dean's list, amazing, you know, so great. I got a, a, some kind of merit from a, whatever Bank of America, amazing. Head of student union, always good. You know, it shows that I'm active. You know, well, this is like the best education I could have shown, maybe an exchange to, uh, I don't know where, <laughs> okay? An exchange to Singapore for a year could have been nice as well. But, you know, this is the best education I could have shown, you know, nice three bullets that show my merits and show that I was active in the student union. If I look at my professional experience, this is how you should show. Again, you should say the name of the company. Then you remember, you should re uh, give a good company description. Um. And uh, I didn't do that here, I'm sorry. Uh, but I did uh, kind of explain my specific job. Uh, sorry, I did give a company description actually. So let's say Aringo Strategy Consulting, consult is, uh, it consults on financial issues to government and Fortune 500 companies, okay? So first of all, I show this isn't a little company. I just invented it. It's a company that helps Fortune 500 companies. They won't take anyone, right? They'll only take the best companies. And then I showed my progress in a company. First of all, I showed I was a business analyst. You can see from the bottom. And then I got a promotion. And if you look at the bullets, you know, I led a team. I created something. I designed something, okay? I put money, okay? You can see at the bottom, $400 million. I put some 30% more, okay? I did some kind of upgrade. And this is very important for schools. They need to compare between an architect, a lawyer, a programmer, and an accountant. This is an impossible task. So they don't really care what you do. Remember my, me, the programmer knows Java. That doesn't mean anything, but the architect obviously doesn't know Java. But if I lead a team of three people, okay, also by the way, programmers might lead teams quicker than architects, okay? But if I manage to sell more than I was supposed to sell, okay? Maybe I beat my budget by 20%. Maybe I got some kind of merit. Maybe I got a compliment from my client. So. You just need to work on your achievements in your specific job, okay? And just explain your specific job. By the way, I spoke to a lot of hardware engineers. It takes 10 years to get your first promotion. So obviously they don't have three promotions, but you can still show, you know, in the um, 360 organization um, uh, process that there is every year, my manager gave me a 10 out of 10. Uh, in, uh, I don't know, I got the highest bonus. I got uh, my project won some kind of award. You can still show your achievements within your professional job. So that's how you show your professional experience. And the uh, extracurriculars in the exact same way. So here I, I showed community experience in a separate section. And I showed how I volunteered in the exact same way. So Ringo Youth, you know, I volunteered uh, and raised $15 million, et cetera. What you can use these sections is you can use them to strengthen other areas. Let's say me as a programmer, I never uh, managed anyone. So I showed that in the business clinic, whatever that nonprofit is, when I volunteer there, but I lead a team of five people. Maybe I never worked with abroad, but this uh, whatever uh, business clinic, I worked with a company expanding to China. Maybe I don't seem very interesting, but I ran a marathon and raised money, whatever, raised 50 million. That's nice. Okay. Again, I just invented everything. So you don't. And if you look at the interest, again, I kind of accompany it. Okay. You know, I'm so professional, but I also like to play the guitar. <laughs> okay. And in several rock bands. Wow. I'm such a cool person. I, I don't have to play the guitar. And I lived in Singapore and whatever. So um, that can accompany a profile that doesn't have international experience in, in a work environment. So I try to choose here different activities that can really strengthen my total application. 
Okay, so that was the resume part, but a little surprise, um, not such a big one. <laughs> I promise this is an interactive session. And uh, someone asked me on the chat if I would, you know, what's the biggest mistake I received when I received an, uh, a resume? So in this last part, if I would have received this resume, I would have actually been quite cross because I think the text is amazing because I wrote it, but I think the formatting is horrible. So I've actually put here by, not by mistake, uh, by on purpose, several formatting mistakes. Can you spot them? This is the time for the chat. Uh, can you spot formatting mistakes? Okay, you can just say the, you know, the word you see a mistake or the area or something. I'm gonna drink my tea, sing your song, la 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 la. It's on you guys. You need to find some formatting mistakes and write them in the chat. I can see one. I'm not gonna reveal the mistakes. I'll just say there are several mistakes in plural. When I say several, I mean quite a lot. Okay, I can see already one. Good, come on, Maria, you can do another one. I'll give you another second. So if someone's watching this on YouTube, again, we're starting to have some um, um, comments on the chat and about mistakes that you can see here, I'm gonna give you another 10 seconds and drink my tea. and compliment the people that are giving um, good tips. So Arian, you actually found a difficult one. I'm very proud of you. Uh, so we'll mention them soon, all these mistakes. Again, you don't care about the text here, just looks for some formatting mistakes. Now, again, I know it sounds petty and oh, come on, what's important is the text. When I look at a resume, the first thing I look is I look at the formatting. Okay, I want it to be nice. You've been working on this. Remember, you've been working on the GMAT for X amount of months, maybe half a year. You've been working on your applications for two, three, four, or five months. Okay, don't do formatting mistakes. Okay, okay, are you ready? Do you want to see all the mistakes or shall we wait for one more on the chat? Okay, I'm going to start, but you can keep writing them. So I'm actually going to show you all the mistakes from the top of this document to the bottom. You might see quite a few. Okay, so actually you spotted the first mistake in the chat, very good. So from some kind of reason, I decided to separate my phone number and my email and my email and my address in two different ways. Now, this is a very common mistake because people sometimes copy and paste this from different places. Again, it's not a big deal. Okay, let's be honest. This isn't a big deal. I'm not sure the reader would even see this, but still quite, you know, quite silly, right? Why would you do that? Okay, another uh, mistake that you spotted in the chat was that the sections from some kind of reason in one of them in the additional information, I decided to use bold, right? So great for me, but why did I only do it in one section? Now, again, there's no right or wrong. I didn't tell you at the top to use the straight line and not the backslash, okay? I didn't tell you here to use bold or don't use bold. Uh, by the way, can you see there's additional information, two points after that as well, that's nice. <laughs> so again, it's not right or not right, just be consistent, okay? Um, okay, so you started commenting about the year alignment in the chat. So can you see 2016? It's just a bit annoying. What's it doing there? It should go three centimeters to the right, right? A bit annoying. Uh, let's continue with these stuff. This is a very difficult one. Uh, again, a lot of people kind of copy and paste from different areas, maybe from their LinkedIn or from old resumes, and then write some of the resume, you know, new. And there's little inconsistencies like this one. So there isn't a right answer how to write numbers, but definitely don't use two different versions. Don't use dollar sign 20 and an M, and then in somewhere else, write 15 million USD. These are, you know, two, you know, should just say, you know, 15 M, or in both of them, it should say million USD, but just, you know, keep consistency. Okay, here's another little alignment issue, uh, both the year on the right, but also Ringo Youth, as you can see, it should have been under the business clinic. And from some kind of strange reason, I decided to put five spaces before I wrote a Ringo Youth. You know, I'm a bit silly like that. Um, okay, these are the main things. Ah, 
I love this. Full stop. Can you see that little dot at the end of youth? I don't know why, but in some bullets, or actually in all the bullets, I decided not to put a dot at the end of the bullets, which is fine. There's no grammatical error in putting or not putting a full stop, but please just be consistent, okay? And there's no reason to put a full stop, this little dot at the end of one bullet out of, you know, four or five or 10. Uh, and I think those are the main ones. There's one small one, which is difficult. Um, so this is an alignment issue, right? We discussed that before. It should go more to the left. And here there's another consistency issue. So I, I wrote, I traveled to 34 countries, but I lived in Singapore for three years as a child. Now, again, I'm not sure if this is a grammatical mistake, but again, it's a bit annoying to use digits for three years and to use uh, you know, words, letters for the 34 countries. What I would prefer is probably just to change the 34 to the digits, you know, three, four. I think that would have been more consistent. So again, that was a little exercise for you. Hope you enjoyed that. Many, many, many mistakes, right? <laughs> so, okay. So thanks for saying you didn't notice most of them. Uh, I think uh, I, I think the big one here is like the alignment. And I think Maria, you did notice the alignment ones. And if, if we would have fixed the alignments, you know, maybe both on the left and on the right, I'm not 100% sure the reader would have seen, you know, the rest, especially that full dot at the end or bold here and there. But again, you know, why, you know, if your reader actually reviews your resume, why find mistakes in a resume? And these are mistakes, okay? You know, we can discuss the context, you know, a matter of quality or, you know, opinion, but these are just silly mistakes. Okay, I hope you like that. Ah, we have, wait, this is our ugly one. And here's our beautiful one with all the dates aligned to the right, all the bullets aligned to the left. No full stops, uh, no bold on community experience. I think Shimri Winters is still in bold here, but I think that's allowed because that's like my name. Um, yes, I think you can see numbers, traveled to 34 countries, raised $15 million for the poor. Amazing, I'm such a nice person. Okay, that might be a big mistake. Okay, let's move now to the essays. So the resume is the most important document, but it's just one. And usually 99% of the time, you'll probably use the same resume to apply to a few schools. There's no problem with that. The essays are very, very different. Each school will have their own set of, of essays, very different one from another. And even if they're similar, one of the factors the schools looks at is how much do you want to apply to this school? And if you're using uh, if you're applying to Colombia and their essay says, why MBA and why Colombia? And if you're applying to London Business School and their essay says, why London Business School um, and why MBA? That is not the same essay, okay? Because Colombia will want to hear a lot about why Colombia. London Business School will want to hear a lot about why London Business School. So here are just some high level tips. Uh, and then we'll go specifically into two of the most common essays. So. I know it sounds really, really, really obvious. Just make sure you're answering the question. Uh, so if I had to say what the biggest essay mistake I've seen is, and I see it, you know, not often, but maybe 10% of the essays that are sent to us as a first draft, I would say answering the question. And I see it mainly in like NCAD essays or Stanford essays, which are a bit, uh, they're open essays. There's a lot of room to write it in different different uh, ways and to write about different things. Okay, Stanford asks a question, what matters most and why? What matters most to you and why? And you can talk about love and peace. You can talk about your grandparents. You can talk about your work. I love to work. <laughs> you can talk about running marathons, okay? There's no right and wrong here, but just make sure you're answering their question. Okay, another thing is a word limit. Okay, I know it sounds silly. Some schools allow going over the word limit. We actually at Ringo say, yeah, you can probably go over 5% in most schools, even 10% in some. But again, why would you go over the word limit if you don't need to? Okay, so you're investing three months in this and then you're writing a 505 word essay when there's only 450 words allowed. Um, obviously include your research. I put here about NCAD, but I meant about any school. Okay, so you want to show the school, you want to show Colombia, you want to go to Colombia. You want to show London Business School, you want to go to London Business School. 
How do you do that? How do you do this? When they ask why NBA, you can say, and after speaking to Shimri Winters, NBA 2015, he suggested I go to the venture capital club. And he said, okay, that shows that you've done research about the school. Um, always be modest. So, but still you need to promote yourself. So of course you can't say I'm the best, I'm the best, I'm the best. But you do need to say, I do I have great plans. You know, my plan is to open a new club and my plan is to be very successful and to donate a lot of money to the school and, and whatever. But, you know, you do need to promote yourself in a modest way um, and be very, very specific, specifically about your career. I'll show this in the next slide. Um, the reason I talk a lot about career is most schools will ask a very specific question, which is your career goals. OK, and it can be. Why MBA and where do you see yourself in 10 years? And it can be more specific. It can be what are your short-term, long-term career goals? Okay, this can be a 50-word to a 500-word essay. Okay, it just depends on the school. And again, you have to be very specific about yourself and connect the school so you can't copy and paste too much of NCAD into Stanford because you have to be a bit connected to the school. When we talk about the career goals, I think I mentioned this before about the restaurant guy. Remember a restaurant manager, or uh, sorry, a waiter that became a shift manager, that became a restaurant manager, can definitely go to NCAD or definitely go to Northwestern Kellogg. But he needs to explain why he wants an MBA and he needs to come with a very realistic goal. So first of all, be clear about the goal. Don't say, I want an MBA to make a lot of money. No, I want an MBA to advance myself. No, be very clear what you want to do. Be, choose a specific, specific job and employer. And it also has to be realistic. So a good example would be, for me, I was a programmer in a big company. And uh, after my MBA, I would like to uh, make a shift to, to product management, which combines uh, technological skills and business skills. So it will also combine my past and the MBA. And I would like to work in a global company like Amazon or Google. OK, so I'm very specific, very clear. I mentioned the company, I'm a specific job, and I think I gave a realistic goal. Programmers that do an MBA, yes, they can shift to product managers. Okay, again, the restaurant manager, he probably can't shift to Amazon. Okay, he would have to think of a different career. Um, obviously, this might change in the future, and schools know this. I might go and work in McKinsey. Schools are okay with this, but they just want, the, uh, they want to see how you give your best shot in an articulated way and show what kind of career goal you would like. Okay, obviously you have to show an understanding of this specific, specific job and what it will take from you. So I want to be a product manager and that's why I need the MBA to learn, um, I don't know, different sets of business skills, international network, etc. Okay, and I wrote here also aspirations and goals. And aspirations can be kind of like my, you know, my long-term goal. Okay, so the reason I want to do this is I want to then open my own startup in the long term and create positive impact on my community in this very specific area. Yes, uh, so I want to work at Amazon as a product management in uh, autonomic vehicles. <laughs> and then I want to open my company of autonomic vehicles or whatever. And uh, I want to make a you know, positive impact because I'm going to uh, minimize uh, traffic and uh, casualties from uh, car accidents. Okay, so that's how I showed, uh, you know, something very specific. Okay, so that's a bit about career goals. Again, this is probably the most popular essay. Okay, why MBA and what are your short term, long term career goals? Another popular uh, essay would be, uh, tell me about an achievement. Um, so we're going to finish soon. I can see uh, I'm getting a message. So we only have a couple more minutes. Um, so what are my achievements? Okay. So here again, I would definitely go for a good achievement and just let the achievement talk for itself kind of thing. Okay. So you have to choose a good achievement. Like, you know, I, uh, was promoted for something specific and uh, the client uh, said it was great. And I sold a uh, 10% more than I was supposed to. When we talk about uh, like a failure, I like to say, don't shoot yourself in the leg. Don't, don't do something too bad, okay? But just highlight how you've grown. What did you learn from this failure, okay? 
Um, I'm just gonna pop here to the recommendations and then we'll finish. Um, so MBA programs don't want academic recommendations. They don't want a family recommendation. They don't even want a minister. What did I put here? Of agriculture that knows your family. They basically want your boss, your previous boss, your boss's boss. They want someone who knows you from a professional uh, environment and can say, I've been working with Shimri for three years uh, and he's the best. Usually you need two recommendations. And again, they need to be from a work uh, experience. And you can try and help your recommenders help, you know, help you. You know, you can write to them, you know, thanks so much for recommending me to Harvard. Don't forget I was the best. Don't forget this project. You know, you can definitely remind them about all different things before they write the, uh, your recommendation. Okay, so I kind of tried to finish this very quickly. Um, obviously, once you um, apply, there's the interviews, uh, but we'll have to discuss this on a different session. So uh, this is a Ringo again, how we help you. We're very good. Um, these, these are my details. Check us out on aringo.com. This is my email. I am always happy to receive uh, CVs and prof profile questions. But again, I, please send me your CV in advance. So I actually know who you are. Um, and I am, uh, again, you can, if you want to drop off, everybody can drop off. All good. Um, and